President Biden has announced that the U.S. would respond militarily if China attacked Taiwan. China said in response that no country should underestimate its firm resolve and strong ability to protect its sovereign and territorial interests. Beijing also urged Washington to stop saying we're doing things in violation of the One China principle. China has also threatened those who play with fire will certainly burn themselves. The United States and China are already at odds over a myriad of issues as regards technology, trade, Hong Kong, and South China Sea. Now, what about Taiwan? Are the two powers heading for a collision over Taiwan? Welcome to The Spotlight. I'm your host, Behrou Snechafi. Let me introduce our guest in tonight's episode of The Spotlight. We'll have retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel and former Pentagon analyst Karen Kiatowski from Mount Jackson, Virginia. Also, the spokesman of the LaRouche organization, Harley Schlanger, joining us from Potsdam, Germany. Welcome to the show. Let's uh, begin with Karen. Good to have you with us. So, American war planners had previously left the question of U.S. defending Taiwan against Chinese aggression unanswered. But now you have President Biden openly saying that his country will take military action in that case. So, does he really mean it? What has changed? It's hard to say if he means it or not. I think, actually, the president does mean it. Um, he imagines himself to be a, a king, I think. Um, and I don't think he reads the, the small print. I don't think he understands uh, the agreements. He is a person who likes to use threatening language, and, and he uses it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have this uh, state-run Chinese newspaper, The Global Time, saying that Biden's remarks uh, are not gaffes, but dangerous signals that the U.S. intends to drop support of the One China policy. So how do you see the future relations between Washington and Beijing? Um, the current relations aren't, aren't as good as they should be, and the future relations could very well um, get worse. And I think part of what Biden is uh, indicating and why his staff is allowing him to indicate these things is to actually create uh, a kind of ambiguity beyond the normal support of one China policy, but an ambiguity on the use of military force. And the question was asked of the president this time, this is the third time in nine months that he has uh, made such a statement about coming to the full defense of Taiwan. And all three times the staff has walked him back from that. But this question uh, recently was in context of the Ukrainian uh, defense. The 40 billion that were just uh, the United States uh, Congress just gave to uh, or voted to give to Ukraine and also the 20 billion before that it has already been uh, committed to Ukraine. So this is a large military response and that's what Biden is um, imagining that he would he would do in a case of Taiwan. I think on in his mind he would do that. Okay. Now Harley is also joining us uh, from Germany. Harley, good to have you with us. So this uh, state-owned uh, paper, the Global Times in China, is saying that China-U.S. relationship is like Titanic, and it's heading for an iceberg. I wonder if you agree with that. Oh, absolutely. And it, it's almost entirely the fault of the war party in the United States. Uh, we've seen an escalation of rhetoric regarding Russia in Ukraine, and now we're seeing the same thing in China. The intention after the withdrawal from Afghanistan was to carry out a pivot to Asia, which includes the Quad, which includes the idea of an Asian NATO, which included the AUKUS agreement, the Australia-UK-US nuclear sub-agreement. Uh, you have Admiral Richard, the uh, chairman of STRATCOM, saying that the US is now more likely to use nuclear weapons than it had been in the past. There's, there's an illusion that exists within the top advisors around Biden, which is that U.S. military power is invincible. And mm -hmm. I think they actually are working on mm -hmm. war plans for limited nuclear war uh, preemptive strikes with Russia and China. Mm -hmm. And in our view, it's completely insane. But it, it is this view of the unipolar world that the U.S. can dictate with its NATO allies, who really don't bring much to the table, except for the British, who actually are part of the crafting of these plans. Mm -hmm. Harley, uh, we had this reporter asking President Biden that the U.S. did not get involved in Ukraine militarily, 
What if Taiwan is attacked? And then Biden says, yes, the U.S. would take military action in that case. Now, this is why on his recent Asian trip, he signed agreements with a dozen countries to join uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. So doesn't this send some kind of mixed signals? I mean, speaking of war, at the same time clinching trade deals in Asia, what's Washington's agenda in Asia? Well, first of all, no deals were actually signed. There are no agreements. It was an agreement to reach an agreement the so-called Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. Agreement, a number of the Asian nations are hesitant because they, they're they watching what the U.S. is doing in Ukraine, where, look, I would say the U.S. is virtually a co-belligerent. The weapons that are being delivered have made a bit of a difference to help Ukraine, but more importantly, they're trying to bleed Russia. I think the same intention exists with China. But you have to realize the issue of, of trade is a phony issue. If the U.S. wanted more trade in Asia, it could join the Belt and Road Initiative. It's been invited to do that. Mm -hmm. What it's trying to do is contain China and stop China's uh, aggressive commitment to infrastructure and development. And that's because the whole Western financial system depends on cheap labor and cheap raw resources mm -hmm. from the poorer countries of the world. All right. Uh, uh, let's turn to Harley now. Harley, uh, I want you to answer the same question, uh, please. It's an important one. Uh, let our viewers know your opinion about what Washington's uh, true intention is and what's the plan for Asia. Well, the plan is to stop China. The uh, intention is to make sure that you can continue favorable trade agreements for the United States. In other words, for global corporations from the United States to get cheap labor agreements, to get a, a, a supply chain from poorer Asian countries. But the Chinese, which used to do that, have changed. And that's a, a significant change. Now, the second significant change is the China-Russia agreement. The fact that China and Russia are agreeing not just on military, but on economic policy. You know, one of the important things, and I know many people in Iran know this, one of the important aspects shaping Western policy is the idea of preventing an alliance between Eurasian uh, economic development and Europe. And this is what the Ukraine situation is about, and this is what the China situation is about. Mm -hmm. This goes back to British geopolitics and Mackinder in 1904, and the fact that Russia and China are integrating Eurasia with uh, uh, Eastern Europe, or Russia, and th this is very attractive to people in Germany who otherwise are suffering under the sanctions policy. If Germany were to join with Russia and China, it would be game over for the city of London and Wall Street to be able to dictate economic terms globally. Okay, Karen, uh, you know that uh, Washington has a close relationship with Taiwan. But officially, it pursues, uh, uh, you know, the one China policy, and President Biden also confirmed this. Now, there is no official ties between the U.S. and Taiwan, but Washington sells weapons to Taiwan. It has, uh, you know, great trade relations with it. Is this not contradictory to the one China principle that Washington is saying that it's sticking with? It is. It is somewhat contradictory, but, um, you know, there's money to be made in Taiwan, and, and it certainly serves an American purpose to... Uh, uh, irritate China in that regard. Um, I wanted to agree with uh, what Farley said and mm -hmm. add one thing to it as far as the nuclear sure. threat. Uh, Biden, after this, went to South Korea and uh, renewed a, a, a statement of, of shared defense and for the first time ever used the word nuclear in his uh, uh, range of weapons that we used to defend uh, South Korea. So this idea that nuclear war is being planned for is well documented. Of course, the Pentagon has published uh, documents. Rand Corporation has published documents on the winability of a nuclear war. Um, but this is clearly something that is out there. Biden is talking about it. He is hinting at it. And I think we have to take him seriously. I, th I, I am a concerned, of course, that Washington is willing to blow up the entire world to destroy it, to uh, achieve its aims. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Karen, let's also talk a little bit about the so-called Quad Group, the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. And, you know, this has kind of alarmed Beijing. What's the plan? Um, I think, you know, the, the, uh, the world is changing. We've got the multipolar uh, 
power sharing future, which the United States is unwilling to um, to uh, really cope with. We're not going to tolerate that, in, or Washington, D.C. is not going to. So much of what passes for our foreign policy is really a war against a multipolar world, which cannot be stopped. It's already well down the well down the road, um, not just with military cooperation, economic cooperation, but also financial cooperation, which we're seeing right now in, uh, with China and Russia and many of the other countries in dealing with uh, U.S. sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, a kind of uh, Harley, uh, Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping has said that reunification between China and Taiwan is inevitable and he refused to rule out the use of force. So what's the prospect like for the two countries? Well, I think the, the Chinese do not want to have a war over Taiwan. Uh, there were significant developments of improved trade relations, uh, 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 economic investment in Taiwan from China, uh, mutual cooperation in, in uh, artificial intelligence and other areas. But this, as, as Karen was saying, this irritates Washington which seems to believe that all trade must flow from Washington and London or from Wall Street and London. And the fact that China has become a major economic power is the real problem because the unipolar world, which people in Washington swear loyalty to, is based on the idea that no other country can dictate terms of trade. And the idea of the Great Reset is an, an intention of putting all the power in the hands of central banks, which really represent private banks and private corporate cartels. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that China can work with poorer countries as in Africa, in South Asia, even in Latin America, there's, there's uh, in the, the Caribbean, Caribbean nations are opening ties with China and the uh, State Department is going crazy over this. So mm -hmm. it really is the emergence of a multipolar world. It's unstoppable. The only thing they can do is blow it up. And I think that's why you're seeing a, a reaction, which I think from Washington is seen in many capitals as panic, panic over losing the unipolar world and over the fact that with inflation, with supply chain problems and other things, the Western economies are in terrible shape. Mm -hmm. Now let me put the same question to uh, Karen, Karen, what do you see on the horizon for China and Taiwan? Uh, would there be a war or would there be reunification at any price, like President Xi Jinping is saying? I, I don't see the unification. Um, I agree with Harley. I think between those two are to come together to have trade. Um, even as China, uh, despite some of the things we've seen with uh, the COVID-19 response, even China is in some ways, uh, listening to its people more, that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Being a more uh, uh, integrated democracy, it's not a democracy, but, but they, they listen to their people. So it's not even the stereotypical uh, dictatorship or communist state anymore. That, that doesn't exist over there in that regard. So I think um, a peaceful coming together and, and a profitable coming together is, is down the road, but I think it'll take a lot of time. This, you're talking, honestly, generational. Uh, if, if you don't do it via war, you have to do it when the culture itself changes. And I think that culture is changing when it's going to take time. And I'm sure the Chinese uh, are willing to wait for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harley, um, China and Russia conducted joint military drills today. It lasted 13 hours. Of course, they're saying that this is routine practice. So what signal does that send to Washington and its allies in Asia? Well, you know, I, I was talking to some people around the Pentagon recently and they acknowledged that their whole plan for military confrontation was always based on the idea of either war with Russia or war with China, mm -hmm. but not a two-front war. And this, of course, blows everything out of the water for them, because the idea that, that the United States would have to carry out operations in, in the Pacific and with uh, Russia, it, it doesn't work. I mean, the United States had trouble maintaining forces and uh, control in Afghanistan. So I think the, the problem that people in Washington have is that they tend to see things as military first. The February 4th meeting between Putin and Xi Jinping was primarily about economic integration, uh, a coordination. Mm -hmm. 
And the military was secondary, but they knew that if they came closer together economically, it would provoke a reaction from the U.S. and NATO against them. And so, of necessity, they have to be prepared militarily. But it, it's also clear that Washington's policies are driving much of the rest of the world into a distrust of the dollar and the U.S. Uh, you know, the U.S. just stole $30 billion from Russia. Uh, China is trying to figure out how to pull some of its uh, investments in the United States out before it faces the same kind of problem. So in, in all of this, Washington is the problem. And I, I think unless something changes dramatically, and of course you have a bipartisan consensus on these policies in Washington, uh -huh. uh, we, we may be in it for a long, long war. Okay, on that note, we come to the end of the show. Let me thank our guests. We had retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel and former Pentagon analyst Karen Kiatkowski from Mount Jackson, Virginia. Also spokesman of the LaRouche organization, Harley Schlanger, joined us from Potsdam, Germany. And thank you for watching uh, this episode of The Spotlight. I've been your host, Behrouz Najafi, and I'll see you next time.